All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, welcome. Uh, we'll go ahead and see if uh, some other people don't join us here in a bit. Um, yeah, uh, just a couple of things, a couple of uh, things to note just at the beginning here. Um, this will be the, the we're going to do tonight and then. We are going to take a break for a few weeks. I'll be on uh, vacation, a vacation break for a little while, uh, for a few weeks. Oh, is my sound coming through here? Test, 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 test. Give me one second here. Hold up one second. Sorry, this is bad, 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 bad. Okay, yeah, should be. All right, uh, so we're gonna do this tonight, and uh, and then there'll be a few weeks where where uh, I won't be doing this, and then Lord willing, we'll pick up again um, sometime early on in August. Uh, so, uh, but tonight we have a great. Another great um, uh, account of uh, of the lives of two two men, two men who who uh, were were part of. Um, they're known as as Oxford martyrs, and there's three so-called Oxford martyrs because of where they were tried. And um, the other was was the man we looked at last week, um, Thomas Cranmer. If you remember that. Uh, that account last week of Cranmer, who is uh, uh, this archbishop, he came up under King Henry and uh, through the reign of Edward the Sixth, and then uh, Jane Grey's very brief nine-day reign, and then under Mary, Bloody Mary, uh, he was arrested, and he, you remember, he recant, he recanted at one point, and then he uh, repented of that, and. Um, ended up going to the to to uh, he ended up dying and being uh, murdered killed um, for his faith. So uh, the other two men um, that were referenced last week, they were friends of his that were were killed before him, uh, were Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley. And so that's who we're going to talk about tonight. Now the the whole point of this um, when we were just talking about doing these profiles was not to necessarily just pick martyrs. Uh, but it seems that uh, a lot of the people we've looked at have been martyrs. Certainly, um, uh, Tyndale and Cranmer, and now Nick Ridley and uh, and Latimer were martyrs. And uh, I can't remember who else all we covered. Uh, Luther wasn't martyred, but um, anyhow. Uh, so, but but the idea was just looking at at men and, and women who faithfully uh, held fast to the truths of Scripture, to the truth of the to the authority of Scripture. And, uh, and, and the, the, the great doctrines of the Protestant Reformation, which I think really are just evangelical doctrines. They're, they're, they're Bible truth, truths, uh, the truth of the gospel by God, of God's grace. Uh, that we are justified by God's grace through faith in Christ alone, not of any works. Again, this is Ephesians 2, uh, lest anyone boast. And then we're just looking at profiles of, biographies of people who held these truths um and, and uh just to to learn some of our family history if you will uh family heritage spiritual heritage as as believers and as protestants today so um so to, tonight um we're going to talk about hugh latimer and uh and nicholas ridley so um if you remember hopefully if you have, have listened along um we've talked about some of the political situation in England at the time in the 1500s, and it's a bit confusing. Um, but, uh, um, but it's, it's helpful background. It's kind of important background because it all factors in very directly to, to what happened to these men. So just very briefly, if you recall, uh, there's King Henry the eighth and he is basically Catholic uh, Roman Catholic, um, the Church of England was was under the authority of, of 
Roman Catholicism. But then partly through Henry's reign, he, he takes the Church of England out of out from under the authority of, of Rome. He's not a convinced Protestant. He has his own motives. He wants a divorce and he's not going to get it from Rome. And so he's trying to get it through other means. And so again, he's got his own less than uh, godly reasons uh, for, for taking the church out from under the authority of Rome. Anyway, uh, when he died, his son Edward VI took over and as king and he was 10 years old and he reigned till he was 16. You remember this story? We talked about Edward. He's a godly young man was raised um, by, by tutors. Well, yeah, tutors had great influence on him. One of those was that Thomas Cranmer we talked about last week, but also Latimer, uh, I, I believe also uh, instructed Edward as well. So he was a, a convinced, um, a, a convinced Protestant. So he encouraged Reformation. This is going to factor into today's lesson. Uh, he encouraged the, Ref the Reformation of the Church, re reforming it, and so Latimer and Ridley and Cranmer and others were, were part of that process uh, of, of bringing about reform. And then Edward died when he was 16. So only six years into this, he died of tuberculosis, and uh, I believe, and he, he, yeah, he died. And 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 what he did is he inst he installed his cousin Jane, Lady Jane Grey, as Queen instead of the, the rightful succession went to his oldest half sister Mary. She was a convinced Roman Catholic and hated Protestants. Uh, and and uh, uh, Edward did not want her to to succeed uh, to take over as Queen after Edward. Uh, Cranmer Latimer did not want that to happen either. And so they they conspired to have uh, Jane Grey take over as Queen. We talk, again, we talked about Edward, we talked about Jane in other, in other episodes. She also was, uh, she was deposed after nine days, Jane was, by Queen Mary, who then brought about a wicked um, purging of uh, Protestants and had many of them, hundreds of them, uh, burned, and a lot of them had to flee to escape her tyranny. And so all that background, once again, factors in because this is when Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley uh, lived and ministered and ultimately died under Mary, uh, Mary's persecution. Um, so uh, we'll just uh, jump into this here and, and cover these two men. So Latimer was born in 1485 and he was born to in England and he was, he was born to a, a farming family. So a relatively um, seemingly insignificant family, I guess uh, in the, in that day anyway, in those, uh, but he was he was a he was bright, sharp, had a sharp mind, and they recognized this, so they did what they could to make sure he got educated, and he did. He went to Cambridge and uh, got several degrees there. Um, and while he was there, the the writings of of um, of Wycliffe, back all the way back to Wycliffe and of Luther, were making the rounds in Cambridge were significant. And at this point, Latimer is a a devout Catholic. He was raised that way, and he remained an ardent. Catholic at this time. And in fact, he was uh, um, doing what he could to, to, to stop the Reformation at this time. He's arguing with students and, and begging them to, to come back to Rome and to stay true to Roman Catholicism. And, uh, and, and in fact, even his, his, uh, his, doctor, his divinity degree uh, it was defended with a, um, an attack in, in the year 1524 with an attack against Philip Melanchthon and his theology. So Philip Melanchthon we haven't really covered him, I don't think, but he was kind of Luther's right-hand man and then essentially took over after Luther's death, sort of leading the German Reformation. But uh, so, so Latimer's uh, against the Reformation um, through his time at Cambridge. Uh, Latimer's conversion was brought about eventually by, um, through this man, Thomas Bilney. Now, uh, as, as I was reading through this uh, and came across this name, I had to look him up. Uh, Bilney is an interesting guy in his own right. Um, became Protestant, and uh, and and um, well, let, I'll I'll read this and then and then I'll just mention a couple more things about Bilney. But uh, Bilney noticed that Latimer was intelligent and a good orator. He began to pray that God would convert Latimer and use him to promote the Reformation. God answered Bilney's prayer in a remarkable way by helping him think of a way to share the gospel with Latimer. Bilney went to Latimer and asked to make confession to him. So Bilney is going to confess to Latimer. 
Kneeling before Latimer, Bilney shared, quote, the anguish he had once felt in his soul, the efforts he had made to remove it, and lastly, the peace he had felt when he believed that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Latimer no doubt knew this anguish as he tried to live by the rules of the church, which could never satisfy a guilty conscience. And so Latimer listened, trying to chase away his thoughts. But Bilney continued. When Bilney finally arose from his knees, Latimer remained seated, weeping. The gracious Bilney consoled him. Brother, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Which is, of course, a quote from Isaiah 1, 18. So, uh, so Bilney um, proclaims the gospel to Latimer, and he, and he believes. He finally believes. And, uh, and so... Um, yeah, Bilney is an interesting guy. He, he actually uh, had a lot of influence on various men at Cambridge. And then he was eventually arrested. And he actually did, like Cranmer, he recanted. He recanted and, uh, and avoided execution and was set free. Uh, but then his conscience was racked by this, uh, by this uh, bailing on the Lord and on what he, he truly believed. And after uh, some time, the churches were closed to him. He was not allowed to preach in the churches anymore. Um, but he went out, out into the fields and preached in the fields and, and continued to preach um, the gospel. Uh, his, he, he taught in accordance with uh, Protestant, you know, biblical Christianity. And so um, this got him in trouble again, and he was arrested again. And this time he he went to his death as well. So similar to Cranmer, um, some waffling, and then um, and then eventually dying for his conviction so interesting in his own right i don't know anything else about him really so um anyway latimer was convicted about the errors of the roman catholic church and began to speak against them the change of protestantism came slowly for latimer as the word of god began to shed light on the errors of roman catholicism he began to be convinced that the only way to salvation was through faith by hearing the preached word of god which is essentially what romans 10 teaches uh, God had done what no one thought possible. Latimer became a Protestant, a child of God. His attacks against the Reformers stopped, and he began to point out the errors of the Roman Catholic Church with as much zeal as he had criticized the Reformation before his conversion. He was even so bold as to write a letter to King Henry protesting a new law which had forbade people to read the Bible as they pleased. So again, it's it, depending on where, where we're at, Henry's up and down. Uh, he wanted, remember, Henry wanted... Uh, Tyndale killed for trying to, uh, he loved one of Tyndale's works. And then later he wanted Tyndale killed for trying to translate the Bible into English. And then a year after Tyndale was killed in Europe, caught and, 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 and killed, uh, Henry then approved of English Bibles uh, in England. So anyhow, uh, at this point, at one point, Latimer writes a letter to the king um, saying that not having the Bibles was, was ridiculous. So, that's a bold move, obviously. From the time his eyes were opened to see and understand the gospel of Jesus Christ, Latimer was untiring in his efforts to make it known to others. He, like the Apostle Paul, determined to know nothing else among men save Jesus Christ and him crucified. He was an earnest, eloquent preacher. It was unusual in those days to hear such preaching, and a great number of people followed him wherever he went, hungering for the truth. The clergy of the Roman Catholic Church was not pleased. Surprise. They tried to make things difficult for him. Uh, Latimer did not immediately leave the church, however, but remained a member of the Roman Catholic Church for quite some time. When his education was finished, Latimer became a Greek professor at Cambridge. Then he was ordained as a priest. He was appointed to rector. He was appointed rector or pastor of a church in West Kingston in 1531. Because we all know where West Kingston is. Uh, Summoned to London, Latimer did not hesitate to do what he believed was right. The Roman Catholic priests tried to stop him from preaching the doctrines of the Reformation, but he was not afraid of them. He continued boldly and did the work which he felt sure God had sent him to do. The bishops tried to stop him by telling him not to put the Bible into the hands of the people, but Latimer believed that the more people who could read the Bible for themselves, the better. This is, again, this kind of classic Protestant, you know, soul of scripture position. Get the Bible in the people's hands. Uh, they threatened him with trial and imprisonment. He did not heed their threats, however, but went on bravely with his work. At last, they succeeded in having him summoned to London in 1532 to be examined by Bishop Gardner, who was Bishop of Winchester and a powerful enemy of the Reformation. 
Gardner accused Latimer of preaching against the Roman Catholic Church. Latimer was actually ill when his summons came, but he obediently set out for London, ready to defend the truth. The bishops, however, only wanted him to sign a paper stating that he believed the Roman Catholic teachings were the truth, and that any other doctrines were false. Latimer refused. Several times a week they questioned him, but he steadfastly refused to agree with them. Finally, he was excommunicated and condemned. Later on, uh, church history historian writes, and I can't really say this guy's name, so I'm not even going to try. Uh, it seems like a French name. Anyway, a, a church historian writes this. says, Latimer was restored to favor by appealing to the king. He was released only after he agreed to 14 points of Roman Catholic practice and worship, which included approval of Lent and the lawfulness of crucifixes and images in the churches. This moment of weakness was, by his own admission, the low point in Hugh's life. A black day indeed, a sin which he confessed before his God, but a crucial point in his life because he resolved that come what may, he would never do such foolishness again. It was a resolution which would be sorely tested. So again, you know, uh, Cranmer, Bilney, and now Latimer, some measure of, uh, of compromise here, uh, which obviously is not good, but, and they all came to recognize that. And I just a, a warning of the, the importance of, of watchfulness and just being careful and, and praying for endurance and patience and uh, willingness to suffer uh, for the truth and to stand on uh, on the the truth of the word of God. Because even many men and great men have uh, uh, have 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 had these moments of weakness, and uh, we ought not to, I think, look down too quickly upon them. Uh, we can call it sin, but uh, just to then you know, take stock of our own hearts and, and, uh, and just pray for, for mercy to, to stand and, and for the Lord to examine us for where we even presently maybe are, are compromised. And then again, I mean, we put yourself in their position. It's not hard to imagine why someone would, would do that. You know, you're being threatened with horrific death and, and whatever else, um, you know, on a human level, it's understandable as much as they all, I mean, Latimer regrets this moment. It's the low point of his life, according to him, and he resolved this isn't going to happen again. Uh, and so we'll see how that was tested. Uh, during King Henry VIII's reign, Latimer was twice imprisoned in the Tower of London, 1539 and 1546. On one occasion, King Henry VIII asked Latimer what he answered to these charges of heresy. Uh, humbly yet boldly, Latimer answered, I never counted myself worthy, nor did I ever ask to be preacher before your grace, so preaching to the king. But I was summoned to court against my will. And I'm ready, if you dislike my sermons, to give place to those better than I. For I believe there may be many people better fitted for the position than I am. If it would be your greatest pleasure to have them for preachers, I shall be content to walk behind them, carrying their books. But if your grace should choose me for a preacher, I would desire you to give me permission to free my conscience and teach my doctrine according to my audience. Um, so the king was pleased with the wise answer and gave him liberty to go on preaching the gospel. King Henry did not live according to all the laws of the Bible, which we've discussed. He's up and down. He's all over. And Latimer was not afraid to speak the truth to him. Normally, chaplains were very careful to avoid saying anything that might offend King Henry. But Latimer was different. While speaking before the King of England, he never forgot that he was also speaking before the King of Heaven. And his first desire was to say what he knew would be pleasing to the Lord. This gave him courage to say some things before the King that no one else dared to say. Latimer is not afraid to speak about sin and repentance. Despite his pointed messages, the king had so much respect for Latimer that he was never angry with him. So you know, he's just saying what needs to be said, preaching the truth, even before the king. In 1535, through the influence of Thomas Cranmer and Anne Boleyn, wife of Henry VIII, uh, one of his wives, um, Latimer was appointed to be the new bishop of Worcester? Worcester? I don't know how you say that. Now, Latimer had an even larger congregation to serve. He worked enthusiastically, preaching, visiting people, and refuting wrong teaching. Uh, Latimer was chosen to preach at the opening of Parliament in 1536, and in the same year at a convocation called to confirm Henry VIII as head of the church in England. In both sermons, Latimer stressed the need for reform and urged his listeners to do what they could to bring about this much-needed change. So, Again, as we get to later on, just just to, just remember here of all these 
people who could do this. He's, he's even preaching at the opening of parliament. He preaches before the king. Um, so these are men who have, he's a man who has a lot to lose, right? A lot of uh, uh, fame, um, potentially, and uh, reputation among men. Just keep that in the back of your mind. Latimer gave up his position as bishop in 1539, however, when he realized he could not agree with the church that had corrupt doctrines, rules, and practices. His desire was to live quietly in the country studying the scriptures. This was not God's will for him, however. During a storm, a tree fell on him and hurt him badly, and he needed the expertise of a London doctor. So he set out at once to go there. His enemies soon discovered that Latimer was in London, and they quickly brought exaggerated charges against him. This resulted in his imprisonment in the Tower of London. He remained there for six years until King Henry's death. He was released in 1547 when Edward VI became king. So uh, he's held, king, Edward becomes king. He's a uh, convinced Protestant, releases Latimer. Uh, king Edward offered him his former position as bishop, but Latimer refused, saying he was too old. He then accepted an invitation from Cranmer to help him in his work as archbishop. So he moved to Lambeth and began his new work. For the next six years of his life, he assisted his dear friend, Thomas Cranmer. People came to tell him their troubles, and Latimer tried to help as best he could. He became so well known for his kindness and ability to help the poor that people came from all over England to seek his help. As a preacher, Latimer also preached Lenten sermons as, at the court of Edward VI. But rarely did he write out his sermons before or after preaching them. He just steps up and preaches. His scribe, Augustine Berner, recorded Latimer's sermons for other preachers to use. Okay. Edward VI died after reigning only six years, and Mary ascended the throne in his place. When Queen Mary began her persecutions of the Protestants, Latimer knew he was in danger. She sent a message to summon Bishop Latimer to London, having decided that he should be burned at the stake. Latimer heard of this some time before the messenger arrived. Some of his friends urged him to flee, but Latimer would not take their advice. He preferred to seal the great truths of the gospel, which he had preached all his life with his blood, rather than to flee England. He was thrown into the Tower of London with Cranmer, Nicholas Ridley, and John Bradford, another preacher. There he became so frail and spent so much of his time praying that at times he could not get up without help. So, um, you know, again, his, his earlier moment of weakness. But now, rather than fleeing to, say, Europe, which people did. And, and I mean, we had Paul with Paul being, you know, fleeing persecution at times and believers from Jerusalem and early in Acts scattering on account of persecution. It's not wrong to use you know, means at your disposal to avoid persecution. Um, but uh, we also see in the Bible, Paul knows he's going to be persecuted and harmed at, and arrested at Jerusalem, and he goes to Jerusalem anyway. Um, and sometimes men make that decision. And Latimer, by now, he's he's he wants he's prepared to seal these truths with his blood, and so he awaits the arrest, and he is arrested. Okay, so we'll press pause on Latimer for a second now. Uh, this is Nicholas Ridley. Um, uh, Ridley, uh, yeah, Ridley, again, in his early years, he was a convinced Roman Catholic. Um, but while at university, his, his uh, views on this, his understanding began to change. Again, he was, uh, had a sharp mind. He earned a number of degrees by uh, the year 1541. Uh, these guys, they go, education was very different, but off to college at 15 years old uh, for, for a lot of these guys, 14, 15 years old, very young. But uh, so you, you can earn a few degrees by the time you're, you know, in your mid, early to mid 20s. But um, in 1538, Archbishop Cranmer appointed Ridley to be one of his chaplains and vicar of Hearn in Kent. During his years under Cranmer, Ridley slowly began to change his views about Roman Catholic doctrine and practice. His first concerns were to preach Christ and to get the Bible in the hands of the English people. He also changed his view on the Lord's Supper, moving from the Roman Catholic view of Christ's body and blood being literally present during the Lord's Supper to the Protestant position of Christ as spiritually present in the Lord's Supper. Ridley faced opposition for his views, but the Lord sustained him, and he was able even to influence Archbishop Cranmer for further reforms about the Lord's Supper. 
so we've talked about Lord's Supper in these pro, um, teachings. I think back if, you, if we went to uh, the, the one on uh, Luther, I believe we, we talked more about this, but um, uh, but essentially, you know, the, the Roman Catholic position is that the the, um, the bread and, and or the wafer and the and the wine literally they they change substance to where um, when the priest blesses it blesses it it, it really they really become now the, the body and the blood of Christ. So they look like they, it's transubstantiation. The substance changes. It looks like and smells like bread and, and, and wine, but it really is in substance, Jesus. It's his blood and his body. And, and so this is, they come before this, they kneel and, and, and bow before these elements and then they would take take the elements and they would only take the the, the parishioner would only take uh, just the, the wafer just the bread not the wine was not was withheld from them just for priests and uh, and so reformers uh, attacked this as being unbiblical and and, I, and they're absolutely right the, the the presence of Christ at the Lord's Supper is not a literal presence where his, this is actually his 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 the substance is his body that we eat. Um, and uh, this is not what Jesus means when he says, this is my, my body. Uh, and, and I think that much is clear that it's, it's representative of his blood and his, his body. And uh, even he says, this cup is my blood. Well, the cup is not his blood. You know, um, it, it's, it's representative. Uh, he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Well, the, the cup is not the new covenant. Um, it, it, it's, it's representative, right? It, it's, Saying his blood is is inaugurating the new covenant as he gives his his life and dies for believers. Anyway, so the reformers are saying his presence is a spiritual presence at the supper, not literal uh, presence. So so this was a major source of contention at the Reformation. Uh, what, I, I forget where I heard it, but um, but someone had stated that more ink was spilled over this issue at the Reformation than even justification by faith. Uh, the, 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 the cornerstone of the, you know, Christian church. Um, and then a, a major issue we think of when we think of the Reformation, but, but the, the, this was a major, this was, this, this brought about even more writing, uh, the Lord's Supper, which is seems strange in today when we don't maybe think too much about it. Um, so there's a bit of a, maybe a correction there for us, but anyways, so all that to say, Ridley's coming around to a, uh, I think, a more biblical, a biblical view of the Lord's Supper. And just one other element to that, why is it such a big deal? Well, for one thing, men like John Calvin and others pointed out, this is, this is, when you, when you, if, if this is, is Jesus, this, this wafer, this bread, you're bowing to it. That is, that is, that is now precisely what God says we should not do. This is now. An, an idol or an image of God, right? This is Jesus and you've got bread, right? That's an image. That's a, that's a, an, an idol of sorts. And, uh, and, and they bow to it. And so the issue was from, from a, the a Protestant perspective, that's idolatry, right? That's like the height of idolatry. You, you bow before this thing that is said to be Jesus. And, uh, and so that's, that's a major problem. And it remains a major problem in Roman Catholicism. Catholic understanding of the mass. It's the same today. Nothing has changed there. So it is a big deal. It's not just, you know, uh, a small preference. It's a, it's a significant, significant difference. So, um, so anyway, so, so Latim or Ridley comes along to a, a biblical and Protestant understanding of, of the Lord's Supper. Uh, the reign of King Edward VI allowed Ridley to preach the doctrines of the Reformation more boldly. In 1547, King Edward appointed Ridley the Bishop of London. In his position, Ridley was able to do much good for the cause of the Reformation in England. He changed the altars into communion tables, preaching the true meaning of the spiritual presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper. He examined the men who were under his charge for doctrinal soundness, dismissing those who did not reach his standards. He also worked very closely with Archbishop Cranmer, bringing in changes to reform the English church. So again, these kind of high years of, of Edward VI. Now, the people loved Ridley because of his care for the sick and the poor. He had several hospitals built in London. When King Edward VI died, Ridley was part of a plot to put Lady Jane Grey on the throne rather than Queen Mary. 
since Lady Jane Grey was a Protestant while Mary was a Roman Catholic, which we've discussed lots. This plot failed and Lady Jane Grey only reigned for nine days after which Mary became queen. Queen Mary had Bishop Ridley thrown into prison because of his participation in the plot. He was also accused of heresy for spreading the truth of God's word and arguing against the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. So uh, these, these, uh, these men, Latimer and Ridley, are condemned to prison. Uh, imprisoned in the Tower of London, Latimer and Ridley were deprived of any, of any basic comforts. They were tormented and they were questioned threatened and mocked while every effort was made to get them to recant. Again, if you can get them to recant, you know, you win supposedly. And we see there was success in some at times getting different, different people to recant and not just these men. There were a number of professing believers, professing Protestants who when push came to shove, you know, uh, apostatized, they, they bailed uh, and went back and, and some of whom never, you know, never repented of that. But, Anyway, uh, on September 30th, 1555, Latimer, Ridley, and Cramer, who was also in prison with them, were transferred to Oxford for trial and sentencing. Ridley was questioned first. He was reprimanded because he did not remove his hat when the Pope was mentioned. He was not afraid and boldly stated his beliefs. He admitted that he had tried to help Lady Jane become queen rather than Mary. Latimer was questioned next. He remembered the shame of his earlier weakness. But now he steadfastly maintained his faith in his Savior, Jesus Christ. His response to the taunts and ridicule of his tormentors was, I thank God most heartily that, I, that he hath prolonged my life to this end, that I may in this case glorify God with this kind of death. He also was not afraid to state the errors of the Roman Catholic Church. Both men were ordered to appear before the council the following day. Again, they were questioned, but they stood firm. Neither would recant. So they were sentenced to death. The evening before his death, Ridley had supper in his guard's house. He was not frightened nor gloomy. God filled his heart with joy. He invited the guard and his wife, as well as all who were at the table with him, to his marriage the next day. For this is what he considered his death to be. He would soon be married forever with the Lord Jesus Christ. He said he hoped that his sister would be there too, and asked his brother, who was sitting at the table, whether he thought she would be able to come. Yes, I believe she will be present, answered Ridley's brother. I am glad, replied Ridley. This made the keeper's wife weep, but Ridley comforted her, saying, My friend, quiet yourself. My breakfast tomorrow morning will be somewhat painful, but I am sure my supper will be more pleasant and sweet. Ridley knew he would be present at the great feast in heaven. When supper was finished, Ridley's brother offered to stay the night with him, but Ridley answered, That is not necessary. I intend to go to bed sleep as quietly tonight as I ever did. On October 16, 1555, Ridley and Latimer were led out from their place of confinement to a site uh, near Balliol College. Probably didn't say that right. Uh, they passed by the prison where Cranmer sat, but they did not see him. Ridley looked back and saw Latimer lagging behind because of his feebleness. Are you there? asked Ridley. Yes, answered Latimer. I'm coming as fast as I can. When they reached the site, Ridley embraced Latimer. Be of good cheer, Brother Latimer, for God will either lessen the fury of the flames or else strengthen us to bear them. Many of the citizens of Oxford came to watch. Then they knelt down and prayed. Someone preached a sermon on 1 Corinthians 13, B, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. The preacher urged the prisoners to repent and return to the Catholic Church, thus saving their lives and their souls. Ridley said to Latimer, will you answer the sermon or shall I? Latimer replied, you begin first. Ridley asked for permission to speak, but some of their men ran toward him and covered his mouth with their hands. You only have liberty to speak if you recant. So long as the breath is in my body, I will never deny the Lord and his known truth. God's will be done to me, stated Ridley. With a loud voice, he added, I commit our cause to almighty God who shall impartially judge all. Latimer then requested permission to speak, but was also denied. When the men were stripped of almost all their clothing, Ridley prayed, I beseech thee, Lord, have mercy upon the realm of England and deliver the land from all her enemies. An iron chain was fastened around their waists. Ridley's brother tied a bag of gunpowder to both of their necks. Gunpowder was a way of hurrying the death process, shortening the terrible pain. When a lighted torch was laid on the wood, Latimer said to his friend, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. 
We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. That's kind of the classic line from, from, this, uh, from this whole account. Uh, Latimer says to Ridley, be of good, che- good, be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. As the flames reached Latimer, he cried, Father of heaven, receive my soul. He received the flame as if embracing it. After he had stroked his face with his hands, and as it were, bathed them in a little in the fire, as soon, he soon died as it appeared with very little pain. So this is coming from uh, the source of this is Fox's Book of Martyrs, the account of this, uh, this uh, death. Uh, so, so with that, uh, the, the men are, are burned, and, and Latimer's death, the report is, is pretty, um, uh, appears painless, probably smoke inhalation, uh, and he died. Uh, Latimer was the el- older of the two by, by quite a few, 15 or plus years, um, and, uh, and he was feeble, and, and he died fairly quickly, but uh, this was not the case with Ridley. He suffered tremendously, uh, a, low, sl- a slow process um of of being burned in this fire um and uh and then um fox writes this and and as hundreds of bystanders looked on at these two motionless bodies all that could be heard was weeping so finally uh ridley dies and uh and there's weeping in in the audience at the time of their deaths bishop latimer was about 70 years old and bishop ridley was 55 they were heroes of the faith their lives and words speak of great faith in a great God. Latimer's words of encouragement to Ridley proved to be true. The candle of the Reformation had indeed been lit. By God's grace, the work of the Reformers was blessed and directed by God. Many people were converted in spite of the persecutions that continued, and the Roman Catholic Church was unable to stop God's work. Um, so, uh, again, just a, a tremendous story of God's grace in these two men. Um, you know, we see some weakness, but obviously we see a ton of, of courage that they would no doubt attribute to the Holy Spirit, and we should as well. And uh, just a friend of mine today even said to me that reading biographies and looking at history, church history can be so encouraging because it's essentially, uh, you know, just, just examining the work of the Holy Spirit in people in the past. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, th- these, these men uh, were, were prepared to give it all. And, and so just uh, in closing, just want to read from Matthew chapter 8, uh, some verses that just seem very uh, pertinent to, to these two men. Uh, this is Matthew chapter 8 and uh, verse 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, Jesus said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? So this, I think, is something that these men, Latimer and Ridley, um, understood, right? Uh, That obviously salvation is a gift of God's grace. Um, that's received just by faith, by believing. Um, and, and yet the value, it is so valuable that it's worth any consequence that might come to us in this life. And Jesus prepares us throughout the Gospels uh, as believers, uh, all who trust in him, his disciples. He prepares us that it, it, to, to, to suffer. He, pre- he says it's going to cost. Uh, if, they, if they persecuted him, the, the master, they'll, they'll persecute us, the servants. And yet, um, this great, great promise that if we lose our life for his sake and for the Gospels, uh, we'll gain it. We'll, we'll, we will have possession of eternal life. And so that's, you know, uh, Ridley's perspective there the night before he, he's, he's killed. He's preparing to sleep. He's, he's uh, prepared for the, you know, to, to dine with the Lord. And so this, this just eternal mindset, this eternal perspective uh, that these men had, um, seeing through the the vanities of this life and of this world, and and not being swayed to 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 cave 
because they possess eternal life in Christ Jesus. And there, and there's nothing they would do to, to give that up. And uh, so, um, you know, that, that's, that's the reality. If you believe in Christ, that's what you have. And, uh, and, and we just need a reminder of this sometimes. Um, I think often actually, because we so easily lose sight and the, the world around us is enticing with its, its promises and lures and, and the enemy is at work and, and, and um, vanity draws us away and, and there's just kind of worthless things become really exciting to us. And, uh, and, and we feel the lure and we wrestle with our own flesh and we seem to be reminded that, that uh, in Christ, we possess a great um, pearl of great price, just a, a, a treasure that's, uh, that's worth um anything it might cost us in this life and everything it might cost us. And that's what Jesus himself tells us. And that's what we see played out uh, in the lives of uh, Hugh Latimer and, and Nicholas Ridley. So uh, that's, that's it for, for tonight. Um, I just uh, will maybe close in prayer and uh, we'll be done. Heavenly father, I give you thanks and praise for your, your grace uh, truly, the, the salvation you, you offer in Christ is, is so precious and, um, and that you just give it away, uh, that it's just received by just empty handedly just believing uh, in Christ, believing you um, is, is such a wonderful gift. We could not ever obtain it otherwise. And so we praise you for your grace for this gift. And, and I pray for every person who watches this, who hears this, that you would strengthen them to, uh, to remain true, whatever might come, uh, to know that what they possess in Christ Jesus is more valuable than any, any treasures of this world. And I pray that you'd be helping us to, to see this even before we're called upon to even suffer, just to, to recognize, um, what it is we possess in Christ. And, and I pray that this would change everything, that this would uh, encourage us to wake up in the morning and, and, and in prayer and in praise and to come to your word and read it and study it. And uh, I pray that we would go to bed with the, the word on our minds and, and in, in prayer that we would uh, desire righteousness and that we would seek the things that are above and, and put off um and war against our, our flesh and uh, and against all sin. So we just uh, I pray for a blessing on, on each person who would hear this and that you would strengthen us to withstand whatever might come our way. Father, we uh, we are not strong in and of ourselves. We need your, your help and your strength. So we pray you would grant it to us. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, uh, that's it for tonight. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, hopefully, again, we'll see you in a few weeks in, uh, in August. So take care.